Hello! I would like to talk about the Japanese play Kanadehon Chushingula from the year 1748. We know it under the title The Treasury of Loyal Followers or The Revenge of 47 Leaderless Vassals, depending on your opinion. Japanese connoisseurs claim that if you don't understand Chushingula, you don't understand the Japanese way of thinking. The early and then unrelenting popularity of the piece can be measured by the many performances since its creation. The title is a composite construct, as this English disambiguation of Chinese characters illustrates. The main term, Chushin, roughly translates as faithful subject or virtuous vassal, with no Confucian coloration. Here, we are talking about a storehouse, or treasure trove of such followers. The advanced term Kanadehon could be casually translated as practice templates for the Kana. This indicates the coincidence that the number of individuals sworn to the vendetta, the so-called 47 Lornin, i.e. leaderless samurai, is just as many as there are signs in the Japanese syllabary, i.e. the Kana. What do we want to talk about? First, we should roughly understand the plot of the fictional play, essentially depending on relationships. Then, we want to investigate an actual historical incident, the so-called Akko Jiken, from the years 1701 to 1703, in which, according to the Bakufu, 47 people took their lives with their own hands. One unfortunate man, named Kampei, whom we previously saw on the previous slide, committed suicide. Finally, we want to address contemporary legal debates. In fact, prototypes of the play came from the Osaka puppet theatres. At least three stories were merged in the 45 years since the historic incident. The definitive version, the Kanehon Chushingula, is consequently attributed to three authors. The piece divides into 11 acts, as can be seen in this Ningyo Joruli program. Performances lasted a full day, during which audiences were treated to sets representative of life in a variety of social circumstances. The temple, palace of the shogun, a menial hut, the tea house, mansions of the privileged, the abode of the merchant, travelling. The performance begins with an introduction by the Taiyu, the narrative narrator of the Burunaku. Here is the original version of the opening lines with their English translation. All 25 protagonists are already on the stage while the curtain is raised. However, they are strewn across the stage like lifeless puppets. Only as each name is called by the Taiyu do the characters one by one come to life. Chu Shingura is primarily a family drama, set at the beginning of the second Kambukala shogunate in 14th century Japan. Nita Yoshisada has been defeated, and the governor of Kamakura, Ko no Morono, presides over the ceremony assisted by the daimyos Monomoi Wakanosuke and Enya Hangan. Hangan's wife, Kayo, is called upon to identify Yoshisada's helmet out of the 47 as the one to be enshrined. In this woodcut print from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Tariyoshi is mistakenly identified as Hangan himself. Tragedy ensues when Hangan actually draws his sword against Ko Numoro no in the pine corridor of the Shogunal Palace, causing him slight injury. On the grounds of Edo Castle, and particularly during the New Year celebrations for the Imperial Envoys, this is an unimaginable breach of protocol. That same day, Hangan is sentenced to seppuku, and his family is relieved of their thief. Morono is acquitted. Here, Hangan, in the presence of the shogun's deputies, is waiting impatiently for his top retainer Oboshi Yonosuke to arrive. At the very last moment, he manages to whisper final instructions to Yonosuke, who has hurried onto the scene. His followers must vanquish Morono. Yonosuke takes custody of the knife with which his master sacrificed himself that fateful day. 
Schematically, one can imagine it like this. At the top right of the image, we see Morano of the Ko family, identified by the Toyotomi emblem. The red arrow points to his desire, Kaoyo, Hangan's wife of the Enya family. Top left, Wakanosuke as head of the Momonoi family. Each of the family patriarchs has subordinates or retainers. We see Hironosuke, Hangan's highest confidant, who will later lead the 46th Lonin. Also in the picture, Kampe, who unfortunately, due to a secret quarrel with his lover Okaru at the back gate of the palace, could not stand by his master in his hour of need. In this second family slide, we take up Kampe's fate. He has now fled and is married to Okaru. One night, perchance, he meets Yagolo, top left, who tells him about the vendetta against Morono. Kampe desperately wants to join, but financial support is a prerequisite. Without his knowledge, stepfather Yochibe sells his wife Okaru to a brothel in Kyoto. The old man Yochibe is alone on the street at night with half of the advance when he is heinously stabbed to death by Sadakuro and robbed. Kampe, on the hunt for a wild boar, rushes in and accidentally shoots Sadakuro with his shotgun in the dark. Unable to identify the victim, he instinctively takes the purse from the corpse. Tragedy results from the fact that Kampe is held to be the murderer of Yochibe. Here we see him committing harakiri. At the bottom right, a woodcut by Keisei Eisen, showing the preceding sad moment when Okaru was picked up for the Freuden house. Fortunately, it turns out that Yochibe's body has a sword and not a gunshot wound, so Kampe is absolved of the murder. With his dying breath, he is allowed to sign his name in blood as an honorary member of the vendetta. Act 7 takes place in the Ichikiri tea house in Jion, where Okaru is now working. Yunosuke, with a boisterous and seemingly carefree existence, must lull Morono's spies into the certainty that he and the Lonin have no intention of revenge. Here is the iconic scene in which he buys Okaru free that his secret does not fly up. Bottom right of the scheme. Yonosuke saves her life from brother Heemon. She kills the unfaithful Kudayu. Left in the picture. Honzo's daughter Konami has been promised to Rikia, Yonosuke's and Oishi's son. Act 8 is a Michiyuki dance scene, a bridal journey. Tonase moves with her daughter along the Tokaido from Edo to Yonosuke's country estate in Yamashina near Kyoto. Arriving in Yamashina, Konami is rejected as a wife by Yurunosuke's wife, Oishi, on the grounds that Honzo's bribery of Morono, Konami's father, in Act 2, led to Hangan's death. Tonase suddenly declares that she will kill Konami and herself in atonement. Tonase has already raised her sword over Konami as the two are interrupted by flute tones. The flute is played by a travelling monk, Father Honzo in disguise, who sacrificed himself to be relieved of his guilt and, in the act of dying, presents the floor plan of Morono's residence as a marriage gift. Thanks to these plans, the storm on Morono's residence can finally commence. The faithful 46 gather at a Ryogoku bridge at dawn. It has snowed. They cross the Sumida River and invade Morono's estate. Eventually, they discover Morono hiding in a coal shed. He is too much of a coward to kill himself with the knife of Hangan's sacrifice offered to him and must therefore be liquidated by Yunosuke's sword. His head is triumphantly carried by the faithful foreigners to Hangan's resting place in Senkakuji and, after washing in the well, placed on his grave so that the spirit of their lord can finally find peace with a deed accomplished. Let us now turn our attention to the historical incident on the 14th day of the third month of the year Genloku 14, in our calendar the 21st of April, 
1701, which actually triggered the tragic sequence that led to the premature death of at least 48 people. On this day, the daimyo of Akohan, Asano Naganoli, then 33 years old, is said to have drawn his sword in the pine corridor of the shogunal palace Nedo against the koke Kira Yoshinaka, then 59 years old, causing a slight injury. As in the puppet piece, Nagalori was sentenced to die on the same day and lost his fief. It is difficult to find reliable and coherent primary sources for this incident. However, Asano's followers quickly realized the consequences. They had to give up their castle in Akko and become Ronin. This eliminated their guaranteed yearly stipend from the profitable Han, which, valued at 52,000 koku per year in total, actually generated over 75,000 koku, thanks to the sword trade. The population of Edo could hardly miss the sensational act of revenge against Kila Yoshinaka exactly one year and nine months later, on the 14th day of the 12 months, that is, the 30th of January 1703. This was carried out by only a minority of the 300 of the cells originally subordinated to Oishi Yoshio. Kira's estate was located east of the Sumida River in Ryogoku, not far from today's Edo Tokyo Museum and the Ekoin Temple. The current shrine covers 186th of the original area. According to various stories, Kira's head either made its way on foot, carried by the 46 Ronin on their victorious pilgrimage through the city, or was shipped by way of Tokyo Bay to Senkaku Shrine, the resting place of their avenged master Asano Naganoli. The graves can still be visited today. Some facts about the ruling shogun, Tokugawa Tsunayoshi, also known to the people as the dog shogun, probably due to his laws on animal husbandry. In any case, Tsunayoshi, fourth son of the third shogun Iemitsu and a concubine of humble origin, knew how to assert his power by staying abreast of the ways of life of the daimyo, who were subjected to him by way of the Bakuhan system. He did not shy away from a purposeful redistribution of their possessions. Asano Naganori does not fare well in this regard, as he was said to have suffered from pronounced instinct to play and have sex. At least that's what I could gather from the 320 page reference work Tushigula by J. A. Tucker, recently published by Cambridge University Press, as well as other insider knowledge that will now follow. Asano Naganori was born in Edo and spent little time in the fief. His father died early when Asano was only eight years old. At age 16, he was already one of the two daimyo to host the New Year's reception at Edo Castle, under the direction of Kira, 42 years young at the time. This generally demanded unwelcome financial obligations. Naganoli suffered several strokes of fate in his short life. His marriage remained childless. He fell seriously ill with smallpox in 1695 and was head fire inspector in the Edo fire of 1698, during which Kira's residence allegedly burnt down. Kira Yoshinaka inherited the office from his father in 1668 and rose to highest court office in 1680 at the same time as Takugawa Tsunayoshi. Kira could trace his family line back to the first shogun, Minamoto Yoritomo, but earned only modestly from his duties compared to a daimyo like Naganori. Nevertheless, state officials liked to look down on the smaller Tozama daimyo from the remote provinces. Before the unsuccessful assassination attempt in the Pine Corridor, Kira had returned to Edo just a few days earlier, after an extended sojourn in Kyoto. Exactly what might have driven Naganori to attack Kira amateurishly that fateful spring day of 1701, risking life and fortune, may be difficult to reconstruct to the scarce data available. In any case, J. A. Tucker found no evidence that the incident was related to the rejected love for a woman. For us to understand the actions of the actors and the verdict of the shogunate, 
we need to deal with some legal basic concepts of the time. From a bygone age, we have handed down the idea of jiliki kyusai, i.e. the idea that a samurai should practice self-help, writing injustices with own hands, exercising blood revenge only in extremists. Such ideas were frowned upon as old-fashioned in the Edo period, just as lojo and junshi, i.e. resistance to the bitter end, or self-sacrifice for one's master. However, the idea of kenka ryosebai was not completely outdated. In the event of an impulsive physical clash of two aggravated parties, both fighters bear a joint responsibility. Mediation by a third party and reconciliation would appear appropriate. Naganori's followers may have thought this principle violated when they were deprived of their livelihoods. It is less likely that they had forgotten that in the new area of the right of the katakushi applied, the prior registration of vendettas with the authorities, than that the filing of an appeal after a death sentence, and in the case of a fait accompli, would have little prospect of pardon. In the end, the Ronin were convicted courtesy of the striking argument of Toto, i.e. a conspiracy against Magnus Rex. Only spoilers could object that conspiracy usually requires the allying of formerly disparate parties. Cohesion of a clan might not qualify. However, after writing the direct injustice, the executors immediately and voluntarily placed their fate in the hands of the powers that be. We come to the debate whether the Ronin should be considered Chu Shingishi, loyal samurai. Do they deserve to be revered? Here, the Confucian test says that a Shushin can only be a Gishi if he or she has selflessly submitted to a higher goal. The self-image of the Ronin was Confucian, but old-fashioned. The Buddhist would say that the fight for worldly reward does not bring fulfillment, hence Ronin cannot be worshipped in a temple. Legalists also have a problem. After all, the Ronin were convicted and punished under prevalent law. Nevertheless, Emperor Meiji sent a long-awaited popular sign when he publicly honoured the Ronin shortly after taking office. In the minds of the common people, there appears to be a lasting misconception that personal bonds of loyalty, duty and honour cannot be broken by legal formalism. Here. I have summarized some contemporary opinions. None of these fully convince or satisfy me. Only the final thought of Dazai Shundai's argument seems to hold a certain wisdom, since Asano's injury to Kira at Edo Castle was not a capital crime, according to law only murder qualifies, the Ronin's anger should not have been directed against Kira, but against the verdict of the shogunate. Let's better quickly return to the firm grounding of the play, where at least the facts are clear. What are the key motifs? In case we can't think of anything, I have summarized a contemporary assessment of the piece from the Japanese perspective, as well as some thoughts on the Akko Jiken through American eyes. When asked if there are parallels between Hamlet, 1603, and Chushingura, I refer to Haruhe Tsutsumi's joking remark Shakespeare must have read Shushingura. Ms. Tsutsumi from Osaka herself published the melodrama Kanadehon Hamureto in 1992 about a group of kabuki actors who struggled with the difficulties in performing Shakespeare's Hamlet. I guess this shows that even today, 274 years after the premiere of Kanadehon Shushingura and 321 or be it 319 years after the historical incident, the subject matter has lost none of its potential.